share some content with you on 1.1, the Italian Renaissance. So we start with the Renaissance. We're moving past our content covered last week on the Middle Ages. And the Renaissance is roughly about 1300 to 1600. It's a very broad time period. In the Middle Ages, they were just so focused on the church and the feudal structure, not a lot of contact with other cultures. With the Renaissance, we're going to move to a little bit more secular world. That means a little bit less religious, and they still want to glorify God. They're focusing on the role the individual can have on earth. And in the Renaissance, we have a lot of trade with other countries. The trade that the Italian city-states participate in will bring them contact, learn about different cultures, and wealth. By definition, this time period is a rebirth, but there's a, there's a, it's marked with creativity and change. The creativity leads these changes culturally, politically, economically, and socially, and we'll look at that. That's where we get this break from the Middle Ages. They'll focus on learning and what's called the humanities. Um, we also call that the liberal arts today, grammar, poetry, rhetoric, rhetoric is speech, painting, sculpture, architecture, and music. Uh, but this focus on learning combined with curiosity will challenge the old ways of thinking. <clears throat> what we have here is a nice map of Europe looking at the land and the sea routes that promoted change in this time period. We can see the Italian sea as of Venice and Genoa here in the northern part of the Italian boot will be important with their red and yellow trade routes. <coughs> Excuse me. In the northern part of Europe, we have a couple of you know, a couple of cities marked there. We have those blue routes with the overland routes, and the green is the German cities trading with different places. For what we're looking at for this next week or so is really the Italian city states like Venice and Florence and Rome, a little bit of Genoa, and we'll go a little bit to the rest of Europe. Those these Italian city states trading. There is debate among scholars whether or not this Renaissance is a break with the Middle Ages or are we just a continuation of some developments from the Middle Ages. But this, this Renaissance is about this culture and this new focus on human achievement. Your textbook gives you this nice comparison. This builds upon what we looked at last week. So we talked about last week the Middle Ages, and it was more a farm-based or agricultural society. Not much travel, further than 25 miles in your lifetime. Focus upon religion. Um, not a lot of focus on individual achievements. It's hard to identify different you know, individuals from the Middle Ages that are so significant. But if I asked you to name Renaissance individuals, most you can come up with, like Da Vinci and Michelangelo. But you want to add in there Shakespeare, Donatella, Raphael, Machiavelli. And by next, you know, after we go through our lessons, the next five to seven days, you'll be much more familiar with some of these people. Renaissance. The Renaissance in the Italian city-states in Northern Europe will be a little bit more city-based or urban-based. We have trade happening, uh, a focus on learning. This is that rebirth, and they're going to go back and study some of the classical works of ancient Greece and Rome. We have it focused in the Italian city-states because it had, that's where the Roman Empire was. The city-states become prosperous with their trade, and then they can invest that money. They can show it off and be grand by being uh, great supporters of the arts or patrons. So as they support the arts, they'll be patrons or supporters of the arts. This is another map just trying to show you, remind you about this trade that's so significant. The Italians come down to the Mediterranean Sea here on the left-hand side. They're going to trade with the Middle East. Now, for a long time, it's the overland silk route here in red. I want you to think of someone like Marco Polo, but we also have this water route. What we see happen by the 1500s is this push for another route to avoid the overland route, the red route. Um, but you'll see that with someone like Columbus because he's looking for what? The spices and the silks from India and China. The spices are used to preserve the food. So the goal is to trade with other cultures, particularly with you know India and China, and find a route to get there. Oops, sorry, I skipped one there. Florence was an important city-state in the Italian boot and it symbolizes this renaissance time period it's it's dominated by one specific family called the medici family the Med the medici excuse me family grew in power and wealth because they're they were the bankers for the catholic church or the papacy and they have manufacturing wool manufacturing and they're also involved with mining this 
wealth meant power politically and culturally. And the book specifically talks about like the founding father, Cosimo de Medici, and then Lorenzo the Magnificent. Lorenzo was not only the head of the family, but he was um, a great artist himself. He dabbles in these ideals of a Renaissance man. The Italians in all levels were willing to support the arts because the art so translates, the art communicates the values of society here. Particularly, we see that guilds wanted to also flout or show their interest, and a guild is like a trade union. So art was used as a form of competition, I would, I would argue. So the Renaissance art has several characteristics we'll look at. We're going to look at how more, much more realistic it looks, how expression, full of expression it is. So we have really early art painting done here by Masaki, I believe. And it's the expulsion from the garden. This is the Garden of Eden. And then we're going to go to portraits being done here. So we have this duke and duchess, and they're not so significant, but they had themselves painted. They had the wealth to be commissioned this painting. We didn't see portraits being done in the Middle Ages. We don't have any record of this. We see sculpture come back into play. So we have Venus here. The Dimitri family had this commissioned this to be done. So we bring back this the idea of sculptures, individual figures being done. This has quite the balance. And then the subject, Venus, is an ancient Roman goddess. Some new techniques are pioneered, like perspective. We have geometry used in the art. We have a painting here by Da Vinci here. This is a Dreyfus Madonna, a Madonna referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus. We can see the blue cloak here. We see the halo above her. And we can see this use of geometry and how he sets up the painting. Other techniques that are pioneered deals with light and shadowing to make the painting more lifelike. Other significant things that happen in this time period, <clears throat> I'm going to go through, um, particularly looking at Florence. I want you to notice in this picture, this photograph, the du Duomo and the center. So Renaissance Florence, as I said before, is dominated by one family, the De Medici family. We have this symbol, the Florentine lion. They mint their own coins. This is their wool factory. They're going to get raw wool from other parts of Europe, and they're going to manufacture it. So we have, you know, sculptures done of these significant Medici leaders, Lorenzo, really Cosimo first, then Lorenzo. Your book is a really nice inset in looking at this particular family. Um, some highlights here I think are interesting. It's just the sheer amount of wealth they'll have at different times how they have banks, different places, and how they support the arts. Um, you'll, you will not be testing all this, but just they're really breaking down and showing you the power by this particular family. Here's a picture or a sketch of the palace for the Medici family. Here's the chapel. So going back to that picture of Florence itself, here is a beautiful, the beautiful St. Maria del Fiore. Church in Florence, done by Brunelleschi. So we have a couple of different ways to look at this, but he's commissioned to build this dome. And he studies, again, we're going to go back and study the ancients, ancient, the ancient Pantheon in Rome. He's going to build this dome without any columns inside holding up this dome. So here's a close-up of these ribs that help support this beautiful dome by Brunelleschi. And of course, this dome is copied around the globe. It'll be put into the chapel that the Pope will say Mass in, which is St. Peter's. We have another church in London that pretty much copies it. And then we have this strong influence again in the US Capitol building in the, in the United States. Another significant piece of art done at this time here will be on the right. Gaberti does these beautiful bronze doors. And by the way, there's a replica of this in this Hall of Architecture down in the Carnegie Library in Oakland between Pitt and Carnegie Mellon, if you have a chance. You can always go down there for extra credit because this replica. But, you know, look at the skill and it's done these beautiful bronze doors. It's um, a huge door and the detail and the, art, the artistry that's displayed. Sculpture is a form of art that comes back here. We're going to see these nudes done. 
And the subject here is David from the biblical story, David versus Goliath. So we see David done by Donatello. Again, it's a bronze. We're going to see Barofia also do David. And you're probably familiar with Michelangelo's sculpture of David. So this is all I want to cover for the first part of 1.1.